Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel, and this is a short application example of an electrically controlled hydraulic system. Our objective is to examine both the hydraulic schematic and ladder logic diagram of an electrically controlled hydraulic system using both operator-initiated manual input and automatic mechanical input, in this case a limit switch, to extend and retract a hydraulic cylinder a single cycle. Such an action is commonly referred to as a single cycle reciprocation. Additionally, we'll introduce a couple problems with our system and see if we can predict the system's response given these input scenarios. The goal of this system is to use a manually activated push button to initiate the single cycle reciprocation. At the limits of travel, the cylinder will automatically retract. Such a system could be used to perform some industrial task like punching or bending a workpiece. Note that the electrical side of the system is acting as the brains, dictating when and what happens. However, the hydraulic side is acting as the brawn, and it is the aspect of the system that does the actual lifting, pushing, punching, or pulling. Taken all at once, this system may look like a giant squid that ate an octopus that ate a plate of spaghetti, but I'm encouraging you to stop, slow down, and just look at the system as a collection of smaller subsystems. You have all the necessary knowledge it requires to figure this thing out, if you just take each section piece by piece. Even the most complicated of systems can be broken down into its smaller parts. At its most basic division, electrical control is the brain, hydraulics is the brawn. Let's start with an examination of the hydraulic schematic. Here we've got a hydraulic power unit consisting of a pump, reservoir, and pressure relief valve combination. If at any time system pressure exceeds that of the setting of the normally closed pressure relief valve, the pressure relief valve will open and allow a relief passageway to the tank. Here is a directional control valve, DCV1, used to stop, start, or change directional fluid flow on our hydraulic circuit. It is a two-position, spring-offset, solenoid-activated directional control valve. In its deactivated state, it is spring-offset to the cross-connect position, where pump flow is routed to B and tank to A. When the solenoid DCV1 sole A is energized, this valve will shift to the straight-through position where pump flow is routed to A and tanked to B. Actuator ports A and B are respectively connected to the cap and rod end of a double acting cylinder. When the solenoid is de-energized, the cross connect position in the directional control valve allows pressurized flow to enter the rod end and the cap end will exhaust a tank. Therefore, the cylinder will retract. When the solenoid is energized, the straight through position on the directional control valve will allow pressurized flow to enter the cap end and the rod end will exhaust a tank. Therefore, the cylinder will extend. At either the limits of extension or retraction, flow will cease and pressure will rise to the set point of the pressure relief valve. In this system's deactivated state, we would expect the cylinder to be retracted. The physical limits of extension is a limit switch, LS1, which when the tip of the rod contacts it, will change to its opposite electrical state. Given there are components interfacing the electrical, mechanical, and hydraulic realms of our circuit, we should expect to see, at a very minimum, the solenoid, DCV1 sole A, and the limit switch, LS1, in our ladder logic diagram. That pretty much wraps it up for a tour of the hydraulic schematic. If you're standing in front of a real machine, and it's your first time ever laying eyes on it, it would be a recommended course of action to identify the physical location of the individual hydraulic components, inspect for noticeable damage or leaks, and verify proper routing of hoses and connectors. Our ladder logic diagram on the other side consists of two uprights, Let's assume they're powered by 24 volt DC. Our first rung has a maintain contact, normally closed e-stop button, a momentary contact, normally closed stop push button, a momentary contact, normally open start push button, and a normally closed limit switch called LS1 in series with a coil of a general purpose control relay called CR1. Note the start button intended to initiate the single cycle reciprocation sequence is momentary in nature meaning when pressed, it will close and allow current to flow. However, when released, it will return to its normally open condition. To prevent the necessity of having to constantly hold this button down, the ladder logic includes a normally open holding, latching, memory, or sealing contact, CR1A, associated with control relay, CR1, in parallel with the start push button in rung 2. The third rung consists of a normally open contact, CR1B, associated with control relay, CR1, in series with the solenoid, DCV1, sole A. Note when the coil of control relay CR1 is energized, its associated contacts will change states. Both CR1A and CR1B will close. 
When the coil of control relay CR1 is de-energized, its associated contacts will return to their deactivated state. Both CR1A and CR1B will reopen. If you're sitting in front of a real machine, it's your first time ever laying eyes on it. It would be a recommended course of action to identify the physical location of the power supply, the limit switch, push buttons, and control relay and inspect for noticeable damage or disrepair and verify proper routing of wires and connectors. Now that we've taken a brief tour of both the hydraulic and ladder logic diagram, let's see if we can figure out how this thing works. If you're really sitting in front of this machine, your first impulse might be to walk up and push the button and see what happens. I call this the recon by fire technique, and although effective, it is not a recommended course of action. Reconnaissance is a means of determining enemy strength before an offensive action. Recon by fire is a quick and dirty method of determining enemy strength by getting the craziest guy in your squad to sneak within small arms range and simply firing at the bad guys. It doesn't take much poking to stir up a hornet's nest, especially when they're undisciplined militia types. So when the bad guys open up, the rest of your squad sits back and notes the exact positions of troop placements and heavy weaponry like mortars and crew served machine guns turning the surroundings into dust. Recon by a fire is crude and effective, but sometimes not the safest course of action for the guy that poked the hornet's nest in the first place. Let's do some intelligent intelligence gathering and use our knowledge of the ladder logic diagram to see how it interacts with a hydraulic schematic. The safest way to figure out how a system works is to roll out both the schematics and start virtually pressing buttons and figuring out how the system should work. If the schematic functions like we want it to, and the proper components are hooked up in the proper configuration, there's a significant chance our system will function as our reconnaissance would suggest. Let's start by walking up and virtually pressing the start button on our ladder logic diagram. Given the e-stop, stop, and limit switch 1 are all normally closed, we have a complete path of recurrent, and the coil of control relay CR1 energizes. All the contacts associated with control relay CR1, in this case CR1A and CR1B, switch to their opposite states. CR1A closes, as does CR1B. Given the holding contact CR1A is closed, an operator can now release the momentary contact start push button. The start button returns to its deactivated normally open state. However, we still have a complete path of current through the holding contact CR1A to energize the coil of control relay CR1. That's the point of the holding contact. It maintains the last asserted state. In our third rung, via the now closed CR1B contact, the solenoid DCV1 Sol A energizes. On the hydraulic side, the solenoid actuated valve moves the spool into the straight through position, then pressurized flow enters the cap end. The cylinder starts extending. The system will stay in this state until the extending cylinder rod strikes limit switch 1 and opens it. At this point, the open LS1 contact breaks the current path, energizing the coil of control relay CR1, and all contacts associated with control relay CR1 return to their deactivated state. CR1A opens, the holding circuit is broken. CR1B opens, DCV1 Sol A is de energized. On the hydraulic side, the de-energized solenoid and spring offset return the spool to the cross-connect position. Pressurized flow enters the rod end and the cap end is dumped to tank, and the cylinder retracts. When the tip of the cylinder rod leaves the reset region of the limit switch 1, limit switch 1 returns to its deactivated closed state. Once the cylinder fully retracts or otherwise reaches the limits of travel, the pressure relief valve opens, and we've returned to the start state and are ready and waiting to initiate another single cycle reciprocation at the touch of a button. Note the normally closed e-stop and normally closed stop buttons both serve similar purposes with slight variations. Like the normally closed limit switch, both of these buttons serve to de-energize the coil of control relay CR1 when they're actuated into their open position. Let's examine the purpose of the normally closed stop push button first. Let's say an operator has already pressed and released the start push button and initiated extension. However, before striking the limit switch, let's say the operator wanted to halt the single cycle reciprocation action to perhaps reposition the workpiece prior to contact. When an operator presses stop, it breaks the current path energizing the coil of control relay CR1, and all the contacts associated with control relay CR1 return to their deactivated state. When CR1A opens, it opens the holding circuit. When CR1B opens, the solenoid of DCV1 Sol A is de-energized. 
DCV1 would shift to the cross-connect position and the cylinder would retract. An operator could now release the stop button. The stop button would return to its deactivated, normally closed state. We've returned to the start state and are ready and waiting to initiate another single cycle reciprocation at the touch of a button. The function and purpose of the e-stop is similar, with one minor exception. When actuated into the open position by an operator observing some unsafe scenario, the e-stop maintains the activated open state and does not immediately return to the deactivated closed state. This effectively renders the start button useless in that while the e-stop is open, closure of the start button will not initiate the single cycle reciprocation. That's the point. The maintain contact e-stop serves to not only disable this system, it also serves to keep the system disabled until such time an operator resets the e-stop into the closed position. This analysis may seem tedious and time consuming to some. However, this level of consideration is really the punchline behind every lab I've ever run and every example problem or lecture I've ever posted on the Big Bad Tech channel. Imagine how well things will go if you know what you're doing. Think about it before you act. Really take your time and visualize what's happening before you even step foot into lab. Don't rush to build something and grope stupidly at switches hoping you'll randomly arrive at the same number in the back of the book. Understanding takes time and effort and practice, but does return rewards. If you're still with me, let's learn more. What could go wrong with this system? How could it break? How could you identify potential problems? The single most important step in troubleshooting a malfunctioning system is to understand how the system is intended to work in the first place. That's what we just did. You simply cannot perform troubleshooting without performing this step. There are those that sell troubleshooting as a skill entirely separate from understanding, but they are hucksters, swindlers, and frauds. Yes, there are tricks of the trade and shortcuts to be used, but without a solid understanding of how things are intended to work, these turn into superstitious rituals and button pushing, unbecoming of an aspiring technician. Only when you understand how something is intended to work can you pinpoint where a problem may exist. At its most basic level, troubleshooting an electrically controlled hydraulic system is the determination in which realm the problem exists. Is it electrical or is it hydraulic? Or more standardly, is it an electrical problem that appears to be hydraulic in nature or vice versa? Once you've confined a problem in one realm or another, you must then use the basic principles of that realm. If you suspect the problem is hydraulic in nature, you must rely upon the basic properties of strength, speed, and direction. Pressure is the hydraulic property that influences actuator strength. Flow is the property that influences actuator speed, and valve position is the property that influences actuator direction. If you suspect the problem is electrical in nature, you must rely upon the basic properties of series and parallel circuits. Current through series elements is the same. Every voltage rise is accompanied by an equal and opposite voltage drop. Voltage across elements in parallel is the same. The sum of currents entering a node is equal to the sum of currents leaving it. Finally, and most importantly, opens are paths with infinite resistance through which no current will flow, and shorts are paths with no resistance through which substantial current will flow. This being said, Ladder logic is purposely designed to be a simple electrical circuit. If you think about it, each rung in a ladder logic diagram is a series path with one electrical load. Everything else is just a switch. Other rungs are just parallel paths. If you get right down to it, you really don't even need to know all the crazy theory behind the electronics you spent the past couple quarters struggling with. Ladder logic boils down to the simple determination of whether you turn something on or whether you turn something off. At risk of overly simplifying electrical troubleshooting, your problem isn't open and current is not flowing. Yes, there exists the remote possibility of inadvertent shorts, improperly wired components, improper settings, or some other random weirdness. However, the first 99 electrical problems you are going to run across on previously functional systems will all be an open in the ladder logic diagram. 
This is where electrical problems disguising themselves as hydraulic or mechanical problems or vice versa come into play. Consider DCV1 sole A. It is an element that appears in both the ladder logic diagram and the hydraulic schematic, and it is the principal actor governing valve position. Valve position determines actuator direction. If the solenoid is not energized due to an inadvertent open somewhere in the ladder logic diagram, the valve won't change position and the cylinder won't extend. If you think about it, the sole purpose of the entire ladder logic diagram is to govern when DCV1 sole A is energized or de-energized. If DCV1 sole A isn't being energized, your problem is electrical in nature. If DCV1 sole A is being energized and the valve is not shifting or the cylinder not moving, your problem is not electrical but rather hydraulic or mechanical in nature. That's ultimately what troubleshooting is. It's the successive bracketing down and down to a smaller and smaller target area until the problem is found and rectified. Good troubleshooters do this in an efficient and systematic method, and most importantly, don't troubleshoot things that aren't broken. Keep in mind, there is no limit to the wrong that can happen in the real world, but let's imagine some hypothetical scenarios and see if you can assign them into one realm or the other. By all means, pause the lecture at any time and think about these as long as you want to. See if your assumptions match my explanations. Let's start with some easy ones and progressively increase the intensity as we go along. Let's say you're called into a troubleshooting scenario and notice a rapidly expanding pool of hydraulic oil collecting below the system. The problem is quite obviously hydraulic in nature and the system has sprung a leak. Do not cover a pinhole leak with any portion of your anatomy you wish to keep. Injection injuries are very real possibilities with high pressure hydraulic systems. Turn off the system and lock it out and tag it out. Inspect the system for the source of the leak. Most likely the oil is pooling directly below the leak or it can be traced to its source. That's largely the purpose of low level maintenance tasks like keeping systems clean. Not only does it contribute to a neat and orderly appearance, it is far easier to pinpoint a leak on a clean system than one with an accumulation of sawdust, grease, and filth. Most likely a fitting, hose, or seal is worn to the point of rupture. If the system was recently taken down for maintenance, research what actions were performed during the prior maintenance. Perhaps a seal was improperly installed or overlooked during reassembly. Let's say you're called into a troubleshooting scenario and upon entering the room notice an ozone or burned electronic smell. The problem is quite obviously electrical in nature and some component has reached an early end of its life, most likely the power supply, relay coil, or solenoid for this particular system. A subsequent visual inspection might turn up charred or dangling wires or visibly damaged components. The indicator lights on a damaged power supply might not light up. The coil on a damaged relay or solenoid might be black or discolored. And if these devices also feature indicator lights, these might not work either. Ice cube relays sometimes use transparent covers that allow the inspection of their internal workings. Very often you can smell out the damaged component if it is not immediately visible. As stupid as it sounds, smell is a very valid sense for troubleshooting. Not only do damaged electronics have their own signature scents, so too does good and bad hydraulic oil. Fresh and properly filtered and conditioned oil smells sweet and feels slippery and will coat and stick to your finger. Old heat damaged and oxidized oil smells like a dirty campfire and feels like water and that it doesn't adhere well. Let's say you're called into a troubleshooting scenario and you observe the cylinder extending and retracting, but doing so weakly. First and foremost, don't troubleshoot something that's not broken. If the cylinder is extending and retracting but doing so weakly, the problem is not electrical in nature since the cylinder is executing the desired reciprocation sequence but rather the problem is hydraulic in nature. Given pressure is the property that influences actuator strength, my first inclination is to check the pressure relief valve. If the pressure relief valve is set too low, or if it is stuck open due to some contaminant, the system will exert less force than required. Additionally, a weakly extending or retracting cylinder could be the cause of some leak in the system that diverts flow at low pressure and does not allow pressure to build. Let's say you're called into yet another troubleshooting scenario and you observe the cylinder extending and retracting, but doing so erratically and noisily. Again, don't troubleshoot things that aren't broken. If the cylinder is extending and retracting, but doing so erratically and noisily, 
The problem is not electrical in nature, since the cylinder is executing the desired reciprocation sequence, but rather the problem is hydraulic in nature. Given flow is the property that influences actuator speed, my first inclination is to check the fluid level in the reservoir. If the fluid level in the reservoir is too low, the pump is sucking in air in an aeration event. The entrained air is imploding and leading to the erratic and noisy movement. Additionally, this could be caused by a leak or restriction of the pump suction line, overly viscous oil, or perhaps oil that is too cold and simply needs a chance to warm up. Alternatively, the cylinder could have some mechanical problem causing the erratic noisy movement. If the rod was ever heavily sideloaded, the piston could have gotten kinked and be binding when forced to move. The barrel of the cylinder would show noticeable score marks if this is the case. Let's say you're called into yet another troubleshooting scenario and you observe the cylinder extending, yet not retracting. This is where things get interesting, since this system could be routed in either electrical, hydraulic, or mechanical sources. My first inclination is to check the component responsible for initiating retraction, notably the limit switch. If the limit switch isn't being physically struck by the cylinder, the limit switch won't open the electrical path in the ladder logic diagram and the coil of control relay CR1 will remain energized. This could either be the fault of a functional limit switch having been accidentally rotated out of the actuation plane and simply being missed by the rod, or a broken limit switch with a malfunctioning actuator arm. Either scenario would result in the cylinder extending, yet not retracting. Outside of the electrical realm, these observable effects could be due to a mechanically jammed piston at the limits of extension, or since the act of retraction necessitates pressure be applied to the smaller ring-like rod end area, perhaps the pressure relief valve is set high enough to extend the cylinder, yet too low to allow retraction if acting against a sufficient force. Finally, let's say you're called into a troubleshooting scenario and you observe the cylinder neither extending nor retracting. This is again an interesting troubleshooting scenario since this system could be routed in either electrical, hydraulic, or mechanical sources. My first inclination is to start with the electrical nature of the system, since as we discussed previously, the ladder logic's sole purpose is to really just energize or de-energize DCV1 sole at the appropriate time. Before diving into the details of the electrical circuit though, I'd do the obvious and make a quick check to make sure the hydraulic power unit was on and the pump was running. Even if the electrical control circuit was perfectly functional, the cylinder wouldn't extend without a source of primary hydraulic power. I like to say it's a rarity, but very often the first question you should ask in a troubleshooting scenario is whether the power is turned on. Let's take a look at the ladder logic diagram. Let's assume, however, the hydraulic power unit is fully functional. There are a couple ways to begin an analysis of the ladder logic diagram. Perhaps the simplest way is to start at the top and work our way left to right, top to bottom. This way we brainstorm all the possible reasons DCV1 sole A is not being energized. First, make sure the power supply supplying the control voltage is on and providing the proper level of control voltage. Next, is the e-stop inadvertently actuated? A maintained contact e-stop purposely disables the system until it is reset. You'd be surprised how many service calls originate from an inadvertently bumped e-stop. Next, is the stop button functional? A damaged stop button permanently jammed into the open position would also disable this system. Next, does the start button close? A damaged start button that refused to close won't energize the coil of control relay CR1. Next, is the limit switch closed or is it accidentally being triggered? An open limit switch will not allow the coil of control relay CR1 to energize. Next, does the coil of control relay CR1 energize? Control relays often feature an indicator light and transparent housing allowing inspection of the internal electrical mechanical components. A relay with a damaged coil won't function. Next, do the associated contacts CR1A and CR1B change states when the coil is energized? Again, transparent relay housings allow inspection of these internal electrical mechanical components. Additionally, relays make a characteristic clicking sound when the contacts change states. Finally, does DCV1 sole energize? And importantly, does the valve shift position if it is energized? Solenoids, like relays, often include indicator lights to tell when the solenoid is energized. 
On the electrical side, a solenoid with a damaged coil won't push or pull the valve spool into the desired position. On the hydraulic and mechanical side, a valve with a jammed or silted over spool will resist the push or pull of the solenoid and may eventually see the solenoid coil burn out. In short, is there continuity in every rung, and does each rung include a single functional electrical load? In this case, the single electrical load in rung 1 and 2 is the coil of control relay CR1, and the single electrical load in rung 3 is the coil of solenoid DCV1 Sol A. If you aren't energizing these electrical loads, the valve won't move into the straight through position and the cylinder won't extend. Valve position is the property that controls actuator direction. The electrical aspect of this system controls valve position. On the hydraulic and mechanical side, a jam spool, jam cylinder, blocked port, or simply not turning on the pump could also cause this same problem. However, you would be able to observe both the relay and solenoid function. Very often, it is desirable to isolate primary hydraulic and pilot electrical circuits from one another for independent test and troubleshooting purposes. All right, I've saved the best one for last, and this time I do want you to pause the lecture and think about it, because there is only one correct answer. Let's say you're called into a troubleshooting scenario where the cylinder does extend with the proper force and the proper speed. However, does so only when an operator is actively holding the start button down. When an operator releases the start button, the cylinder immediately retracts even before hitting the limit switch. Pause the lecture and think about this. Can you pinpoint the single source of this problem? Again, the cylinder does extend with the proper force and speed, however it does so only when an operator is actively holding the start button down. When an operator releases the start button, the cylinder immediately retracts even before hitting the limit switch. Take your best shot. Don't just sit there and wait for me to give you the answer. Pause the lecture and think about this. This problem has nothing to do with strength or speed of the hydraulic system. The hydraulic system is functional. There is a problem with valve position and the source is electrical in nature in that the holding circuit is not being properly established. Your attention should immediately focus on holding contact CR1A and CR1A only. Given the solenoid is energizing and the valve is shifting position, it is evident that the coil of control relay CR1 is functional, as is contact CR1B. However, for whatever reason, Contact CR1A is not establishing the holding circuit. Given one can see the internal electromechanical components inside a relay function, my bet is that CR1A is still functional, just that one of the wires from it or to it has an open or is simply not connected. If you understand how a system is intended to operate, troubleshooting should be straight and simple and to the point. Entirely absent these hypothetical troubleshooting scenarios, are those caused by human error and the motor-driven pump. Let's deal with the first batch of problems first, those caused by human error. Do not for a moment assume all the components as illustrated in the schematic are installed correctly, especially for systems exhibiting problems on installation or after maintenance and repair. This is an especially important consideration when paired up with an unusually dull lab partner. The correct valve could be routed incorrectly, an incorrect valve making use of a totally different spool could be substituted instead. The correct valve could be installed correctly, however, the cylinder just isn't hooked to it. Even when one part of a double acting cylinder is blocked, realize that the cylinder will refuse to extend or retract since the opposite action must occur on the opposing port. The wrong side of a mechanically interlocked push button or limit switch could be used instead of the proper one. Wires could be missing, extra wires could be added, the schematic could be wrong or outdated. In short, trust no one. Lectures on ladder logic documentation and wiring applications exercises available at the Big Bad Tech channel go over proper wire housekeeping and wiring practices. When presented with seemingly irreconcilable differences between your observations and expectations, always confirm that what you are working on is what you are really supposed to be working on. A missing or extra wire a wrong or improperly wired component will most likely result in the system not performing as expected. In regards to the second batch of troubleshooting scenarios, those involving the motor-driven pump, I must direct your attention to the amply stocked motor controls playlist because I am not covering that here. 
my reason in compartmentalizing these closely related subjects is that there is simply too much to discuss about motors and motor control to include this material in the electrically controlled hydraulic systems playlist without it swelling into monstrous proportions. In summary, if the motor-driven pump isn't running, you've got a problem with the motor and you need to budget some serious time and check out this other playlist. I'd really like the electrical controlled hydraulic systems playlist to confine itself with exactly that, the electrical control of hydraulic systems. All right, I think we've squeezed just about every teaching moment out of this circuit that we possibly can, so let's wrap it up. In conclusion, we examined both the hydraulic schematic and ladder logic diagram of an electrically controlled hydraulic system executing a single cycle reciprocation, making use of a limit switch. Additionally, we examined some hypothetical troubleshooting scenarios and discussed possible sources of and solutions to these problems. Remember to review this material as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource, and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates. Thank <laughs> you.